Okay, good morning grade 11s. Hopefully you're doing well. Uh, today's going to be our last week of course content for distance learning. Uh, next week we're going to start on working on your final culminating. You'll have the week to complete that. Uh, and there will be a video tutorial posted uh, about that on Monday and you'll have the week to complete that. And you are done your grade 11 chemistry course content. So today, uh, this week we have three more lessons to get through. So today we're going to start off with mixtures, partial pressures, and reactions. Uh, we are in 12.1 to 12.4 of your textbook, page 576 to 581 and 592 to 597. Okay, so we're going to start off today talking about mixtures of gases and partial pressures of gases. Uh, we're also going to talk about reactions with gases um, using molar volumes, and then I'll give you some time to practice some homework uh, based on what we learned today. So by the end of the class, what we should be able to do is calculate partial pressures of mixtures of gases, as well as calculate moles of a gas using molar volumes or the law of combining volumes. Okay, so uh, many years ago, uh, chemists believed and scientists believed that the atmosphere, so the gases around us, was made of only one chemical. Okay, so essentially the air around us, they believed was just made of like one compound you could think of as air. Even though now we know the room that you're in right now is a mixture of gases. There's carbon dioxide, there's oxygen, there's nitrogen gas, there's lots of gases that are floating around in the room uh, that you're sitting in right now. Uh, Antoine Lavoisier was uh, the first to actually give evidence that the atmosphere, so the gases around us, was made of a mixture of gases. And he's also known as the father of mod modern chemistry. So... What he did is he did a series of uh, experiments that involved burning different compounds in the presence of air. And based on these experiments, he concluded that the atmosphere was made of at least two gases. Okay? Um, one that supported combustion or burning and one that did not. So essentially what he did, a simplified version, is he would have a candle. And um, we know if you leave a candle out, it's going to burn until all the fuel is gone. Uh, then he would take a candle and he would put a jar over top of it. And essentially what would happen at some point, we know oxygen, we remember back from unit two, is required for combustion. So at some point, if there was a jar that was sealed over the candle, the um, oxygen trapped in that container is going to disappear. Uh, it's going to get all used up. Um, and when all of that oxygen is gone, it means that there no, no more combustion can be supported. So the flame would burn out. So based on those observations, he determined atmosphere, so the gas around us has to be made of at least two things. So one gas that supports combustion and one gas that does not. Uh, John Dalton was the next, uh, one of the next scientists who um, specifically did more work on the properties of gases. So he made, hypothesized, he made a hypothesis that gas molecules work independently and they're going to produce the same amount of pressure whether they're in a mixture or on their own. Okay, so essentially what his experiment showed was, let's say I have a container of oxygen gas and it produces three atmospheres of pressure in that container. And I have an identical container that has helium gas in it that produces two atmospheres of container, or two atmospheres of pressure. If I'm gonna, if I then mix or combine the oxygen and helium gas into a new container, that new container is going to have five atmospheres of pressure because all of these gas molecules work independently, so they're all going to produce the same amount of pressure. So essentially three atmospheres is going to be thanks to the oxygen molecules and two are going to be thanks to the helium molecules. So it's essentially that these pressures are additive when you mix them together. So from this, we came up with what's called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. So he came up with the law and it essentially says the total pressure of a mixture of non-reacting gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of individual gases. So if you're trying to figure out the total pressure of a mixture, you just have to add up the individual pressures of however many gases are in that container. And this is because, like, the, like we said, a gas exerts the same uh, pressure, whether it's alone or whether it's in a mixture, as long as the volume and temperature is constant. Okay? Volume and temperature has to be constant because we know volume and temperature can impact the pressure. We learned that back when we looked at our gas laws. So let's look at some practice problems. I'm going to make myself disappear here. 
Uh, let's say we have a compressed air tank for scuba diving to a depth of 30 meters. It contains a mixture of oxygen with a partial pressure of 28 atmospheres and nitrogen with a partial pressure of 110 atmospheres. What's the total pressure of the tank? Well, we know our total pressure in this case, because it's made of two gases, it's made of nitrogen gas and oxygen gas is going to be the pressure of oxygen plus the pressure of nitrogen. Okay, Because the mixture is made of two gases, we need to add the pressure um, exerted by those two gases. So uh, oxygen, it says in the question, exerts 28 atmospheres of pressure. And nitrogen, in this case, is exerting 110 atmospheres of pressure, which means the total pressure of the tank is going to be 138 atmospheres. Okay? So pretty easy. You're just taking up those individual pressures and adding them up together. Okay? So that would be my final answer. Uh, we would likely get a, a mark here for your formula for showing your work with units and for your final answer with units. Now, uh, the only thing that you have to make sure is that each of these individual pressures are in the same units. So if one's in atmospheres, the other one has to be in atmospheres. If one's in kilopascals, the other one has to be in kilopascals. You just have to, you can only add them together if they're in the same unit. If not, you can just um, convert them using the rules that we learned last week. Okay. So this says a container uh, with a volume of 10 liters is evacuated and held at a constant temperature. Into it is injected the same temperature, um, at the same temperature as 2 liters of oxygen gas at original pressure of 202.6 kilopascals and 3 liters of neon gas at, uh, at an original pressure of 303.9 kilopascals. What pressure would be produced inside um, the container? So what we would do is we just need to add up each of those um, individual pressures. So my total pressure is going to be the pressure of oxygen with the pressure of neon. Okay. So in this case, these are both in kilopascals, so we can add them together no problem. Okay. So pressure of oxygen was 202. 0.6 kilopascals that was given to me right here and the pressure of neon was 303.9 kilopascals. So if I add that together we're going to get 506.5 kilopascals. That's my total pressure. Okay? So this law can really easily be explained using kinetic molecular theory because remember we said pressure is actually created when these gas molecules actually hit the wall of the container and bounce off. Okay, So that force, when those particles actually hit the container and then bounce back off, that force that's created on that collision is what creates the pressure. So it doesn't actually matter what type of gas molecules are causing those collisions, it's just that a number of collisions are happening. That's why we can just continually add up those pressures, uh, and that will give us our total pressure. Okay. Um, sometimes to calculate those individual pressures as well, what we'll do if we want to know the pressure created by a specific gas is we'll collect gas over water. So uh, generally how this setup would occur is like, let's say we've done this experiment before, actually before we left distance learning, we have a little piece of zinc metal in here. It's reacting with hydrochloric acid. This is actually producing, if you remember, zinc, if it reacts with hydrochloric acid, is going to make hydrogen gas and um, zinc chloride. Okay, so it would be balanced like this. Um, so this H2 gas is being produced, and it gets trapped. You put a stopper in the top of this test tube right here with a glass tube going through the center, so the hydrogen gas can work its way through. And you would have a container that's originally full of water. And that water, as more gas kind of works through this glass tube and bubbles its way up, this part of the container would eventually fill up with hydrogen gas. Okay? Um, and that's going to force water to go down and down and down and down. Okay? And we're going to have 
a, a container here that's full of hydrogen gas plus water vapor. So just gas that uh, water uh, in the form of gas that's just going to be transforming into a gas just from equilibrium um, at the top of that surface of, of the liquid water. So what is collected in that top little portion, so what actually is going to show up right in here, okay, is going to be a mixture of, like we said, whatever gas is created and water vapor, okay? Um, if the mixture is warm, it's going to contain more water vapor than if it's cold, because we know warm air can hold more um, moisture in it than cold air. That's why, for example, in the summer, it gets a lot more humid um, than in the winter. Um, and what we've done is we've standardized a table that tells you exactly how much pressure water vapor, so uh, gaseous water, pr uh, produces at various temperatures. Okay, so we can see there's an example of the table right here. This isn't something you would be have to memorize. It would be given to you on a test or quiz or exam. Okay, it says, for example, at 17 degrees Celsius, um, water vapor produces 1.94 kilopascals of pressure. So using this table, we can actually pred uh, predict the pressure of the gas collected because we know whatever is the atmospheric pressure within that container, if we subtract from that the pressure of water vapor, we're going to be left with the pressure of the gas. Okay, Because the atmosphere, or the to totality of that top of the container, is just made of a gas and water vapor. So this is really just rearranging uh, the law of partial pressures that we saw in those previous questions. So here's what it would look like. It says in this question, hydrogen gas it's collected using downward water displacement. That's the setup that we saw two slides ago. If the atmospheric pressure is 100.5 kilopascals and the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, determine the pressure of the hydrogen gas. So we're going to say the pressure of hydrogen gas is going to be the total atmospheric pressure, and we're going to subtract from that the pressure of water vapor. Now, in the question, we're told that the pressure of the atmosphere in that container is... Um, 100.5 kilopascals and we're told it's at 20 degrees Celsius so if we look on our table over here we can see at 20 degrees Celsius water vapor produces 2.34 kilopascals of pressure so I'm going to subtract from this value 2.34 kilopascals and that's going to give us the pressure of the hydrogen so I'm going to take 100.5 subtract from that 2.34 that's going to give me 98.16 kilopascals. Okay, so all you're doing is you're figuring out what the total pressure is and subtracting from that the pressure of water vapor dependent on the temperature that you're given. Okay, again, in these questions, you would likely get a mark for your formula, a mark for showing your work with units, and a mark for your final answer with units. Let's do one more. This says oxygen gas is collected using downward uh, water displacement if the atmospheric pressure is 105.3 kilopascals and the temperature is 24 degrees Celsius, determine the pressure of the oxygen gas. So in this case, pressure of the oxygen is still going to be the atmospheric pressure subtracted from that, the pressure of water. In the question, we're given the atmospheric pressure, which is 105.3 kilopascals. And we're told that the temperature is 24 degrees Celsius. So if I look at my table right here, 24, um, the pressure of water vapor is 2.98 kilopascals. Okay. So again, I'm just going to do some simple math here. Uh, 105.3, subtract from that 2.98. That's going to give me 102.32 kilopascals. Okay. So I again, get a mark for showing my formula, my work with units, and my final answer with units. Now, again, if this was given to you in atmospheres, you would just convert the atmospheres to kilopascals because these values are given to you in kilopascals. All right. Just a reminder as well, we talked about last week how we can determine moles of a gas um, from the volume it takes up. So we learned uh, last week about molar volumes and we said it's a molar volume is the volume that one mole of a gas takes up at a specified temperature and pressure. 
So we learned last week that 24.8 liters is how much space one mole of any gas takes up at SATP or standard ambient temperature and pressure. And we know at STP, any gas doesn't matter what it is, um, at STP takes up 22.4 liters. And we learned last week, we can use this similar to how we used mass and molar mass to determine moles of a gas, okay? But instead of putting mass, we would take the volume and we could divide that by molar volume as long as it's at STP or SATP, okay? So that's a review from last week. And remember, this is even more fully explained by Avogadro's theory that says equal volumes of a gas at the same temperature and pressure will contain equal numbers of molecules. Thus, what's neat about volumes of a gas is as long as they're at the same temperature and pressure, we can use mole ratios to predict volumes like we use moles to predict number of moles. So I'll show you what I mean. Uh, so just a quick reminder from our practice problems from last week. It says how many moles are in 13.5 liters of oxygen gas at SATP? Remember we learned that moles is um, sorry volume divided by molar volume. This being oxygen, we know it doesn't actually matter. This could have actually said hydrogen gas or it could have said carbon dioxide gas. It doesn't actually matter what the gas is. All we need to know is that the volume is 13.5 liters. And at SATP, we know that our molar volume is 24.8 liters a mole. So if we take 13.5 and we divide it by 24.8, we're saying that is equal to, and I'm going to report this to three significant figures, uh, because both of these values actually have three significant figures. It's going to be 0 0.544 moles. Again, if this was a test or a quiz or exam, you would get a mark for your formula for showing your work, including units, and your final answer, including units. Okay. Uh, same thing here. What volume is occupied by 1.35 moles of oxygen gas at SATP? We can use that same formula, volume divided by molar volume, but we don't, we're not always having to calculate moles. Here we would say, well, I know it's 1.35 moles. I don't know the volume, but I do know that molar volume is 22.4 liters a mole. So if I multiply both sides by 22.4 liters a mole, didn't leave myself a lot of room here. Okay, that's going to cancel this out. So we're left with volume being 22.4 liters a mole multiplied by 1.35 moles. So this is true because we're specifically told it's at STP. If you're not giving the standard temperature pressure, um, you would have to use uh, ideal gas law. So 22.4 times 1.35, uh, and I'm gonna report this again to three significant figures, would be uh, 30.2.2 liters. Okay, again here, you get a mark for your formula showing your work with units and your final answer with units. So even though gases recur, occur in mixtures around us, they can also react with one another, but they always use the law of combining volumes. So this is essentially saying that volumes of gas combine according to mole ratios. So like we said before, moles of a gas and volume of a gas both can be calculated using um, mole ratios as long as they're at the same temperature pressure, okay, because we know that there's a the same amount of particles in the same volume of a gas, so, okay, so essentially what we're saying is when measured at the same temperature and pressure, volumes of gaseous reactants and products of chemical reactions are always simple ratios of whole numbers. So what this would look like is a question like this. This says a catalytic converter in the exhaust system of a car uses oxygen to convert carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide, okay? So the reaction here is it's saying oxygen gas reacts with carbon monoxide in the converter to produce carbon dioxide. It is also important to note that these all have to be gases for this to be true. This only works in gases. So to balance this equation, if we put a two here, 
and we put a two here, we're now balanced, right? We have two carbons and four oxygens on each side. It says, if we assume the same temperature and pressure, and this is really important, for this law to be used, it has to state explicitly in the question that temperature and pressure stays the same. If it doesn't, you cannot use this rule. It says, um, if we assume that to be true, what volume of oxygen is required to react with 125 liters of carbon monoxide? So what we're saying here is we don't actually have to go through the effort of figuring out moles and converting into another volume of uh, another amount of moles because it said same temperature and pressure. Because that was stated, we can use volumes like we ha used to use moles. Um, so what we can say is that our volume of O2 is going to equal our volume of CO times our mole ratios. Um, so where we used to put in moles, we're now putting in for volume. Okay, and we can do that because it says same temperature and pressure. Okay, so here it's saying if I have 125 liters of carbon dioxide, how much oxygen gas am I going to need? Well, I can look at the mole ratios. It's 1 O2, because there's a 1 here, for every 2 CO. So I'm going to just take 125 and divide it by 2, which is going to be 62.5 liters. Okay, so instead of converting from volume to moles, moles to moles, and then moles back to volume, I can go directly from volume to volume because it said same temperature and pressure. Really important, it has to have this statement in the question for this to be true. Okay, so in this question, you would get a mark for your formula, a mark for showing your work with units, and again, a mark for your final answer with units. Let's try one more. It says, how much oxygen is required to ensure complete combustion of 15 liters of ethene gas, assuming constant temperature and pressure? So we have ethene gas here reacting with oxygen. And again, this is a gas and this is a gas. Um, and we know the products of complete combustion are carbon dioxide and water. Okay. So remember that back from uh, unit two. So now we have to balance this equation. Uh, so we would put a two here. We would need a three here. Mm, actually, no, we're going to need a six here. We're going to need a 2 here, and we're going to need a 4 here, and 8, 7 here. So let's double check that. 4 carbon, 4 carbon, 12 hydrogen, 12 hydrogen. We have 14 oxygen here, and we have 8 plus 6 is 14. So now we're balanced. Perfect. So it says, to ensure the complete combustion, how much oxygen is required? So we're trying to figure out a volume of, sorry, we're trying to figure out volume of oxygen here for the complete combustion of ethene gas. So the volume of O2 that's going to be required is the volume of ethene that we're going to use up uh, times our mole ratios. And we can use this because it says assuming a constant temperature and pressure. And all of these reactants are gases, so we can use those. So it's going to be mole ratio of O2 over mole ratio of ethene. So this is going to be 15 liters times 7 oxygen for every 2 ethene. So that's going to give me, and I'll report this to two significant figures, 53 liters required. Okay, again, here we get a mark for... Your formula, show your work with units, and your final answer with units. All right, so what you're going to work on today is um, five homework problems uh, on the different types of questions that we went through. 
Um, tomorrow we're going to be learning about solution stoichiometry, so it's going to be really important that you have all these basic skills down and you know how to use your different formulas to help you get ready for um, our solution stoichiometry. Okay. Uh, so these are all posted on your textbook. Uh, reach out if you need any extra help. You can check my office hours or send me an email. Uh, otherwise, I hope you're staying safe, staying healthy, and stay at home. Hopefully we'll get to see each other soon. Have a good one.